It took a great deal of energy and expertise to move it. It is the Ark of God. Hi, my name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Television. It is a program designed to take you from Genesis to Revelation, and we want to do that today. On the teaching program today, we're going to learn something interesting. The Ark of God takes careful planning to move. How will they do it? Today they move the Ark, and we'll learn how and why they do it the way they do. Now, Corey is here with Bible History and Archaeology. Corey, what are you talking about today? Today, we're going to be exploring the accumulation of Solomon's wealth. Very good. And Ryan is here with Did God Really Say? Ryan? Today in Did God Really Say, we're exploring a very interesting question in regards to 1 Kings chapter 3. And here it is. Was King Solomon really going to cut a baby in half? Very interesting. Now, you studied today for some things, but what do you have? Well, today, instead of asking a question or looking into the scripture, I'm going to read some portions from letters from you. Very good. So you get to us, and we'll talk about that later on. Right now, get your Bible guide out and your Bible out, because here comes Corey to start the teaching segment off. Our studies today land in the scriptures during the reign of King Solomon, the son of David. Now, during Solomon's time and his reign, uh, the empire really grew. The kingdom of Israel grew by leaps and bounds. Let's take a look. One of the most famous sites in Israel today is the Western Wall, an uncovered section of Herod the Great's renovation projects to the Temple Mount. Just west of the Western Wall, archaeologists have made some headway in reconstructing the history of that part of the city. The site was not a part of the city of David and actually lay outside of Jerusalem's walls, likely until the days of King Hezekiah, who expanded the walls in preparation for Sennacherib's Assyrian invasions. During the days of David and Solomon, the site was used to quarry stones for Jerusalem's building projects. Only later, presumably during the days of Hezekiah, were buildings built over top of these quarries, using the remaining rock ledges as foundations for their walls and filling in the holes of missing stone with packed dirt and rocks. One of these buildings has been tentatively identified as the destroyed remains of an Israeli-style four-room house. This house and surrounding buildings were likely destroyed by the Babylonian invasion that ruined the city in 586 BC. The most intriguing finds were inside the rubble of the house. The lack of everyday living items seems to indicate that the occupants evacuated with the knowledge of the coming invasion. However, there have been several very tiny personal seals discovered that widely vary in style. From a uniquely blended Assyrian Judahite black seal belonging to Hagav, to a scarab style limestone seal preserving the name of Netanyahu, son of Yaush, and a perplexing pink limestone seal with a winged serpent engraving. These seals represent at least four to five individuals, and the Egyptian Assyrian influences in the seals are indicative of the alliances made to try and overcome the growing beast of Babylon. From quarries to expansions, invasions, destructions, and alliances, the ongoing exploration of Jerusalem continues to stand beside the Bible. 
hopefully you can see from just that one tiny slice of study from the ancient city of Jerusalem that there is a ton of history compacted in that area. But what's really interesting is that at the time period of King Solomon, that was a quarry area, a quarrying for stones in what is now a part of the main city of Jerusalem. Now, that is just so fitting because we see Solomon here portrayed in the scriptures as a, a, a builder. He's building gates and palaces and temples and gardens. And uh, he's also building a structure of wisdom and instruction and songs. He's picking up where his father David left off with being really focused on wisdom and being focused on righteousness with God um, in every aspect of life. And he's, he's carrying on that and he's building it. Now he's not perfect and we'll get into that in the next couple of days. But we're gonna be focusing, uh, moving on into focusing on Solomon's physical wealth. It is interesting to read of events occurring in time as we approach the movement of the Ark of the Covenant of God. Instructions for its movement were given at the earlier time to Moses as part of a, a special assignment for the priesthood. Now Solomon must arrange to move the Ark into the Holy of Holies in the new tabernacle. Now this is a fascinating time and place. There's a lot of activity generated around the Ark as the placement develops. As the ark is moved into place, the glory of the Lord fills the temple. So much so that the priests gather there, they can no longer work there. This is an amazing provision, reflecting the unstoppable power of God. Kings 8 verses 1 through 13. Now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel to King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. Therefore all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim which is the seventh month. So all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. Then they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. The priests and the Levites brought them up. Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him, were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted or numbered for multitude. Then the priests brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place into the inner sanctuary of the temple to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the Ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the Ark and its poles. The poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. And they are there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon spoke. Then the Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell in forever. 1st Kings chapter 8 verses 1 through 13 I am so excited that you continue to join us and stay with us it delights my heart because we're going through the Bible and the Bible from Genesis to Revelation all 66 books is exciting it is the most the best-selling book today the most published book today the most translated book today 
and it's exciting to have you join us. So I want to encourage you. We have four points in the Bible Guide, and the Bible Guide is exclusive to this program. It's called the Quick Study Bible Guide. Make sure you write for yours for an offering in any amount. Now, we want to encourage you today. We're going to cover three of those points on the program. And as we do this, it's going to be very exciting. Now, as we look at the review, we're going to ask the question, wisdom in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, do you remember the Ark of the Covenant? It was that thing that Moses built, that box about three and a half feet, you know, and three and a half feet high and four feet wide, a really interesting box with the two angels on the top and the mercy seat. They have the Ark of the Covenant, and they're going to put it in place today. And so we're going to read 1 Kings 8 through 10, and that is going to keep us up with our reading today. And then the Bible is, or we're going to read in the Bible, 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. Now, you've already read it, we've already heard it, and we've already listened to it. But what can we learn? Now, I need you to remember some things as we go back in time and we look at this situation, and then we focus it on today's world. Now, Solomon, this is 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. Now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes and the chief fathers of the children of Israel to King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. And therefore, all the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Etham which is the seventh month. So all of the elders of Israel came and the priest took up the ark. Now the priest took up the ark. Now look at that. That is fascinating. And here we learn something interesting. The ark of God takes careful planning for its move. It is not a quick decision. Now they got ready for this and they got everybody in place and they got the priest in there and they said, we need to do this right. So let's get the priest. And they remembered, of course, from the earlier incidents, several hundred or several uh, 20, 30 years earlier, when David tried to move the ark to the city of David, he had that whole problem. We went through that. But Solomon doesn't want to do that. So he gets the Levites to go get it. Fascinating stuff. Then we go into verse four of first Kings one. He says, then they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of meeting and, the holy, and all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle. And the priest and the Levites brought them up. Also King Solomon and the congregation of Israel who were assembled with him were with him before the ark sacrificing sheep. And they were sacrificing oxen. And they could not be counted nor numbered for the multitude. That is amazing. And so we learn that the ark of God is surrounded with sacrifice. It is moved along with the contents of the tabernacle by the priest and the Levites. So the ark of God represented the covenant of God, represented the presence of God, and they're moving God's presence. Isn't that interesting? And as we look at that, we begin to understand, I see what happened here. When Jesus came and died on the cross and rose, and he showed us and demonstrated to us, well, you know, the presence of God is in you. Therefore, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so this is very interesting. This is on the other side of the cross, and it's fascinating. So you need to pay attention to this because I'm going to bring it up in a minute. We're going back to the scripture in chapter uh, 8, uh, verse 6, it says, Then the priest brought in the Ark of the Covenant to the Lord to its place. Now that's interesting. Into the inner sanctuary of the temple to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their two wings over the place of the Ark. That's interesting. And the cherubim overshadowed the Ark and its poles. And the poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place. That's right outside of the Holy of Holies. In front of the inner sanctuary. But they could not be seen from outside. And they are there to this day. Nothing in the ark, nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb. When the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came 
out of the land of Egypt. Isn't that interesting? Here's the point. The ark of God contains, as a standard for Israel, the covenant of God given to Moses. The covenant of God. Now, the covenant of God is interesting because it is the written place of Moses. And so he says here that the ark of God contains the written covenant of Moses. So this is the word of God, which is in the ark of God, which is the presence of God. And so we understand that the presence of God, the structure of that presence is detailed in the scripture. That's the point. And so as we look at this and as we understand this, even today we focus on it and even today we say, wait a minute, the Bible or the word of God is the details of God's presence. And again, I say to you, as I said to you on the last program, why do you think the book of John says, and the word that is the Logos, the Word became flesh, that is Jesus Christ, and dwelt among us so that we could see that Word and, and we could watch that Word work with us. And so when we say, when you come to God, when you read the Bible through this program, you understand that you are reading the details of the Scripture, which are the details of the presence of Jesus Christ. And so that's why we read the Word. It is so important for us to know the Bible. Study the Word today. Get in the Word today. Now I want to provide some answers to the question of how are we to interpret King Solomon's vast amount of wealth and how he used it uh, in the temple and in his own palace. We're going to be taking a look at some cultural approaches. For many, the history of King Solomon in the Old Testament must be written off as fanciful exaggerations of a much lesser reality. Gold-plated temples and palaces with gold-covered floors and ceilings, an ivory throne overlaid with gold, extravagant precious metal articles for both religious and personal use, and large decorative golden shields are just a few of the wonders of Solomon's proposed kingdom. But what does history say? We may want the Bible to be lying and thus to discredit its uncomfortable theology, but what if it's telling the truth? The 10th century BC, the time of Solomon, hasn't enjoyed as many dramatic finds as other time periods. But this is a testament to the recycling nature of ancient builders. When short on space, it's often more productive to renovate previously existing structures, dismantling and reusing the old building materials. Even still, if Solomon's splendor has historic credibility, it should fit well into surrounding ancient cultures. There should be some affinity, some hint that this isn't myth. In fact, Solomon's practices do go well with ancient cultures and are far less crazy than some would have us believe. Personal bowls, goblets, and plates of gold are known to have been in use with many ancient cultures. Decorative golden shields show up in lists of taken goods and reliefs of sacked temples in the records of Assyria. A little-known practice of the ancient Egyptians was the same as that of Solomon, overlaying pillars, rooms, and articles with plates of pounded gold, secured in such a way that the gold could be easily removed. The most famous intact examples come from the tomb of King Tutankhamun. We even have texts from the kings of Assyria explaining how they overlaid their temples with gold. Solomon's lavish throne of ivory decorated with plated gold finds parallels all over the ancient Middle East in destroyed remains of ivory couches, beds, and wall decorations. The Speck in Your Brother's Eye, a book written by Ron Hembry, brings a biblical understanding of God's plan for you and how to deal with conflict and accusation. When you're wrong, everyone tends to know it. There is no room for help in today's world. 
the politically correct movement has strangled us into times of stress and captured our thoughts into secrets. When someone else is wrong, we tend to jump in and join the gang to capture their actions into failure. But what does the Bible say? What are we to do with these feelings and thoughts that come to us in the accusations? For a suggested gift of $15 or more this month, request your copy of Ron Hembry's book, The Speck in Your Brother's Eye. You can write to us in the United States at Post Office Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, Post Office Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Or you can request the book and give online at www.biblediscoverytv.com. Our phone lines are also available at 724-733-8336 in the United States and 519-940-8338 in Canada. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study as we go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It's exciting, it's good, and next time on the Quick Study television program, I'm going to be speaking about this. Solomon builds altars and tools for demons. God is offended. What in the world happened? All of a sudden, we go from altar building or from uh, God's house to altar building. That's a problem, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about it next time on Quick Study television. Ryan, what did God say? Well, today we're exploring an interesting question which comes from 1 Kings chapter 3. Critics of the Bible ask, was King Solomon really going to cut a baby in half? Let's study. Enemies of the Bible who seek to undermine its authority as the revealed Word of God claim that there are many contradictions and errors within its pages. For example, critics ask if Solomon, a man who loved the Lord and walked in the statutes of his father David, was really going to cut a baby in half in 1 Kings 3, 16-28. In this passage, two women come before the king. The passage reads, And the one said, O oh my Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house, and I gave birth while she was in the house. Then it happened the third day after I had given birth that this woman also gave birth, and we were together. No one was with us in the house. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. So she arose in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while your maidservant slept, and laid him in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning, there he was dead. But when I had examined him, indeed, he was not my son whom I had born. Then the other woman said, No, but the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. And the first woman said, No, but the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. Solomon then asks for his sword and orders the child be divided in two, so that each woman may have a half. However, the mother of the living child, in compassion for her son, says, O oh my lord, give the other woman the living child, and by no means kill him. But the other said, Let him be neither mine nor yours, but divide him. So the king answered and said, Give the first woman the living child, and by no means kill him. She is his mother. It is extremely ignorant to accuse Solomon of actually wanting to cut the baby in half here, when we read earlier in that same chapter that God granted him a wise and understanding heart. Solomon, in his God-given wisdom, knew that this approach would expose the true mother of the living child. One of the problems Bible skeptics have, whether it's by accident or on purpose, is that they often take passages out of context. For example, earlier in this story of King Solomon, in the same chapter in fact, the king specifically asks God for an understanding heart to judge the people so that he can discern between good and evil. It's clear from the context that Solomon certainly would not have killed the child. In fact, that same chapter also records that Solomon loved the Lord and his statutes, which also reaffirms this truth. 
Very interesting. Thank you, Ryan, for all mm -hmm. that help and all that work. And uh, I just wanted to say that I'm fascinated. Every time Ryan comes to the Wednesdays, yeah. I look forward to this. Very it's good. Thank segment. you. What did you discover? What did you learn today when you read the letters? Well, I did take a look at the letters, and I also keep up with the same reading that you're assigned if you are a partner with us here at Quick Study. But I do love to receive your mail, and so I wanted to read just portions of a couple of letters that we've received. Now, we tape uh, quite a bit in advance, so some of these letters are actually just from the very beginning of the year this year. Now, this is from Hildy in British Columbia, Canada, and she starts off and she says, to everyone at Quick Study, thank you for your hard work. And then I'll skip down and she says, without my daily Bible study, my life would be different. Many years ago, you encouraged me. That was one of the best days of my life. You encouraged me to trust my life in Jesus Christ. Praise God. And that is sincerely from Hildy. And that's exactly why we take you and we go through the Bible. In a year, we want to learn more about God and to learn what Jesus has done. This is from Marinette in, in um, Ontario. Thank you for another great year. I can't tell you enough how much I enjoy going through the Bible with you every day and every year. It is my 13th or 14th year with you, and I'm still learning more and more. I love the whole program. That Isn't is that excellent. Great? Thank you very much, and continue to write to us and continue to study your Bible. I'm on my 29th time through, and it is exciting. Solomon and his men have no idea what to expect when they place the Ark of the Covenant into the temple of the Lord. It is amazing how God's glory fills the temple after the Ark is set in place. It is important to know that God speaks to us when we intermingle with His covenant. He is a covenant God. When we know God's covenant and understand the principles around His covenant, we grow wise. It is important we remember that Although we do not have the ark today, we do have the covenant of God. We must know God's word and understand what it says. It's important in this last minute of the program that you hear who it is that brought this program to you. His name is Jesus Christ. And although people support this program, they do so because they love Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you, it's not me or my wife or anybody, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to him today. He died 2,000 years ago on that cross. He rose again on the third day so that you can have a relationship with him. Come to Jesus today.